Hello. Hello. Well, I know who you are, David, uh -huh. um, but could you introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm David Bethurum, and I'm the Executive Director of Catholic Charities for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. And um, I work with a network of Catholic agencies that uh, work in the 39 counties of the Archdiocese, and uh, it's a privilege to do that work. Okay. And if there are people who don't know who I am, I'm Angela Espada. I'm the Executive Director of the Indiana Catholic Conference, and along with my associate director, Alexander Mingus, we try to bring morality into the public forum through talking to people engaged in, in politics and public policy making. Right. And today we're here to talk about Catholic social teaching. Mm -hmm. um, I've said previously that as a construct, I didn't, wasn't really taught Catholic social teaching. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us when you learned about Catholic social teaching as a construct instead of just, you know, the individual principles? Sure, sure. I think probably when I was uh, in high school, it was introduced. I can't say I got the full picture of it, but mm -hmm. certainly got the idea of social justice and so forth. I think at that time, theology was really... Um, immersed in the idea of Jesus as uh, someone that was here on earth and that he was here to, to work with the injustices of what was going on in society. So that was kind of the context of the mm -hmm. whole understanding of that. Of course, when I got older and went to uh, college at Marion University, well, Marion College when I went there, um, at Marion and then later on in my graduate work, I was able to study a little bit more about, you know, all the the ideas of and principles of Catholic social teaching, but also how it relates to the other institutions uh, that we have in our society, family, government, um, education, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, you told us what you do here with mm -hmm. Catholic Charities. Mm -hmm. How does Catholic social teaching impact what you do? Okay. It impacts a lot. In fact, if you really think about it, uh, there are three major pillars that are part of Catholic Charities and why we exist. One is, of course, to provide uh, services and to provide quality services, services that uh, are needed for those who generally don't have access to types of services. That would be, could be mental health, it could be uh, food insecurity, it could be housing, whatever. Uh, that's one particular area. Another area is uh, Catholic Charities and the Catholic Church, uh, us being an arm of, of social ministry of the, of the Catholic Church. Um, another pillar is our ability to convene. Uh, we are able to convene um, people in communities, uh, either government, uh, education, uh, health care, um, as well as people who we serve to be able to get an understanding of what the needs are in a particular community. Um, now, let me interrupt you. When you mm -hmm. say we're able, you're able to convene, mm -hmm. do you mean other Catholic organizations or just anybody in the community? Who anybody might in to... the community. For example, I'll give you an example. Let's say we're going to uh, have a, uh, a new uh, community coming as refugees into in Indianapolis. We generally convene educators, health care workers of all types to be able to understand the needs of the refugees that are coming, uh, the size of families that there are, and also be able to inform them of uh, the ideas that we are receiving that are needed. So uh, in other words, we're kind of that uh, initial you know, group that's saying, okay, we're going to help them by being able to be part of the Department of State, Catholic Charities USA being part of that, and Catholic uh, and USCCB. But the issue of it is, is that we then come out and say, this is what's going on. This is how you could help them and know what they are in the community. Okay. So that'd be public school system, could be private, it could be uh, Catholic health care, um, providers and or others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it goes back to what I often say um, mm -hmm. to lawmakers, even though we have, um, you know, here in Indiana, a third of our mm -hmm. lawmakers are Catholic. Mm -hmm. I remind all lawmakers that you don't have to be Catholic to believe and promote in the ideas of Catholic social teaching. That's exactly right. And exactly particularly right. when you're talking about the common good. Mm -hmm. um, and um, 
the common good is kind of a an umbrella mm-hmm. for other doctrines of Catholic social teaching. That's Within right. Within Catholic charities, we can see how mm-hmm. you're promoting the common good. Mm-hmm. We can talk about solidarity, and mm-hmm. we can talk about subsidiarity. Mm-hmm. Can you explain how those other two, the two S's, mm-hmm. how those impact the work sure. in Catholic charity? Sure, sure, exactly. Ex- explain solidarity and, and how that impacts your work. Okay. Well, uh, as far as solidarity goes, uh, what impacts is that we always comes back to being able to look at the dignity of all people, so uh, which is of course has an impact on what's the common good, right? Right. And so, and so another an, another core Catholic social teaching uh-huh. respect for the human dignity right, of the right. person. So exactly. they're all interconnected. So having that conversation is that we have uh, communities that we work with. Uh, let's say we're in a rural community versus an inner city community. They all have a particular. Uh, personality, if you will. In Scripture, uh, in the Old Testament, we used to call that a corporate personality of, of the Jewish faith, that they all had a particular um, personality because they belonged to that community and were also connected in a faith. For, for us, we use that same concept with solidarity, being able to say it's their neighborhood, not our neighborhood. We might be part of that neighborhood or that community, but we want to hear and listen to what that is. So solidarity, from our point of view, from Catholic Charities, is that it starts off with the understanding that in order to partner and to be really help those in that community that want help, we need to then first listen. That's our first step that we need to look at and be as listeners in order for anything else to be able to set forth, um, any needs to be addressed. There was an organization, um, oh, it was Dr. Paul Farmer's organization, Partners in Health, and mm-hmm. one of the big things, even though it wasn't religious, although there ended up being a lot of nuns in Haiti who sure. worked with it, yeah. um, mm-hmm. Listen, and it was called Partners in Health. It was because we're going to accompany you and walk alongside you right. to find out what you need and how we can help. Mm-hmm. Not be this organization that swoops in and tell you broken people how we can fix you. That's exactly right. And and part of that, mm-hmm. the undergirding of that mm-hmm. was respecting the people where they were and how they found their situation. That's exactly right. Yeah. I think it was uh, Pope Benedict that mentioned that very concept of the idea of that the reason why we solidarity is so important, and then subsidiarity is also part of that, mm-hmm. is being able to uh, not only respect the persons and what their needs are, but n- let them also know that they have a lot to say and to give to the community. Mm. I think unfortunately many of uh, people that either are, um, that we help through Catholic Charities are at a point where they don't feel like they don't have the ability to help themselves. They kind of have this gap uh, because of the problems in which they've had in their life. And so they become rather defensive and feel as if, you know, nobody really cares. Well, for us to really care, and be caregivers, we need to set out and be able to listen first what their story is so that we can better understand and walk with them, just like you said, through accompaniment and being able to assist them in what they need. Earlier, Brianne said something that was really important uh, when she was talking about respecting the dignity of the person. She said seeing the whole person instead of seeing their brokenness, mm-hmm. or, the, or another word for that would be their vulnerabilities. Mm-hmm. And I think some of the people who need help, they're so accustomed to people seeing them as broken that they begin to feel that they are broken. You're exactly and, and maybe right. not even worthy of mm-hmm. that help. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's the important thing about solidarity, not just knowing that people are out there, but then internalizing that and feeling Mm -hmm. that this is my brother and sister and how can I help my brother and sister and standing with them Mm -hmm. instead of and they have talents and gifts in which uh, just needs to be tapped into Mm -hmm. and be able to say yeah you do have those and you are able to have um, a say in what your future and what your otter your everyday life is going to be like now Mm -hmm. you do this as service and a mm-hmm. mission mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. your profession. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you say to people who are listening who, you know, their job isn't, you know, 
like essential workers or in charity, how do mm -hmm. they, you mm -hmm. know, promote mm -hmm. the common good mm -hmm. and, and, and be in solidarity mm -hmm. or recognize subsidiarity in mm -hmm. their fellow people? Yeah. I think it's important for, I think uh, subsidiarity is, is one of the principles in which most uh, Catholics probably don't fully understand. Not because they don't want or to. Or lawmakers. Or lawmakers. That's true, too. <laughs> and if you don't mind, I'm going to read the catech what the catechism says about subsidiarity and, the, and that particular principle because I think it's real important. Um, in that, the catechism says uh, that subsidiarity is a principle that a community of higher order should not interfere in the internal life of a community of a lower order depriving the latter of its functions, but rather should support it in a case of any need and help to coordinate its activity and its activities of the rest of society, always with the view of the common good. Now that's a, that's a really good definition, but let's break it down for a second, just like you said. Now for the average person, what does, it, what does that say? Well, it says two things. It says, first of all, that we need to advocate, and that's the third pillar of Catholic Charities, that we advocate for and with those we serve, and we do that through being able to communicate to the larger entities like government or uh, health care systems or um, town halls, whatever it might be mm -hmm. that we need to be able to communicate with, uh, to be able to advocate what the needs are of those that feel like they don't have a voice. The second is, is being able to give them a voice. In other words, to be able to really listen to what, that, what their needs are, what ideas that they have that could be able to help with them and so forth. Now, um, for the other piece is that the word um, subsidiarity comes from a Latin word subsidium, which means to provide. So in our view, the larger entity government is to help provide so that all people have the ability to grow and become fully who they are called to be and so if that's the case then we as a church through catholic charities and through our ministries and through the peoples in the pews is being able to how do we provide for those who are in need and what are the principles behind that? Well, the principles is, as I had mentioned before, being able to listen, to advocate, to be able to maybe even provide services if need be. That's why parishes have food pantries. That's why they have, uh, some even have some mental health uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, providers in their particular area in which they uh, work with. Um, and also educating the people in the pews uh, which many of our priests do a very good job with that, and deacons as well, is how do you serve and reach out to those that are in need? Now, a need is not necessarily those that are poor. Right. Those that are in need could also be the people that are sitting there that are grieving mm -hmm. a loss of a spouse or a loved one. Um, and it could be the very fact that somebody is uh, in sitting in that pew that doesn't have any energy whatsoever other than to get through the day <laughs> because of what they had to face. I remember one time I was in a parish, and I won't tell you the parish's name, but and in fact it wasn't in the archdiocese, but I was asked there to kind of talk about these kind of uh, topics. And I remember standing in the sacristy with the parish um, council president, and I could look out the door of the sacristy, and I could see some people sitting in the pews. Well, it just so happened I knew one of the people that were sitting there. I could look right over the altar and saw them sitting there, kind of mm -hmm. at the end of a pew there. And it was a woman. And uh, in the midst of all that, the council president was saying, you know, you know, we have the same people doing the same thing all the time. And all we have out here are people that are like uh, pew potatoes. You know, couch potatoes, oh, you know, the okay. idea of yeah. a pew, pew potato, potato. Okay. that they're just sitting there in the pews and they don't really do anything and so forth. And I looked out there and I happened to know that lady's story. And I said to him, well, that may be true in your mind, but really sometimes 
that lady who was out there, I didn't mention who she was, but I didn't mention the whole story, but her story was basically she was in an abusive relationship. She had a, uh, an adult son that had particular needs in which she was trying to address and be able to handle in case something would ever happen to her because she knew the, the father would not be able to take mm-hmm. care of, of him. And so I was saying, you know, sometimes people just need the rest to be able to come here and say that they are together, Mm -hmm. solidarity, but also that their needs are resting in the prayer and Eucharist and in the community of church. So I take that, I think God gave me that experience. I I didn't even think of what I was really saying there. To me, that was the Holy Spirit probably talking Mm -hmm. uh, through me. Uh, Because one, I'm not that smart, but two, uh, I think uh, it, it opened my heart to understanding a little bit more that sometimes, as you said, people are tired. They don't even know that they can get themselves out of their situation. And that's where we, as a larger entity as church, needs to step forward and say, we can help you. But we first have to recognize that they're sitting yeah. in the pews. Well, and to that point, also, we as individuals... I mean, Mm -hmm. particularly in our neighborhoods and in our churches, Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm -hmm. instead of just nodding and going on your way, I mean, asking, how are you? Mm -hmm. And waiting for a real response. That's right. And if someone says they're fine, but they hesitate, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, maybe asking, Mm -hmm. are you really? Yeah. Do you need help? Is there something I can do? That's right. Because sometimes people just need someone to listen or to show that they care. That's right. Or maybe if God puts it on your heart to ask that person, maybe what they need is something that you have knowledge about and mm-hmm. how you how you can help them. That's right. So, yeah. or you know someone that does exactly. That's right. mm-hmm. yeah. So, taking the time to remember that you don't have to be a part of an organization like Catholic Charities, mm-hmm. or that you don't have to work for the Archdiocese mm-hmm. to actually every day. Mm-hmm you know, practice Catholic social teaching. It's true. You know, in another way, you know, advocacy, for example, you know, we certainly advocate. We work with uh, the Indiana Catholic Conference and, and yourself and with uh, Alexander on on certain issues and try to give you information of how what we're seeing that's out there that uh, is a need and, and how to address it from a, uh, some of the issues that legislators uh, work on good example of that just recently has been on uh, mental health. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a big issue since COVID. It certainly has raised up an issue in the, in the, through the government of the state of Indiana. And they, you know, just recently had a uh, mental health summit a couple months ago in which they invited all of these uh, organizations and entities, part of that, Catholic Charities was part of mm-hmm. that, to be able to say, you know, um, this is an issue that is facing our whole state, and how do we go about addressing and being able to do that? And so the government, which is, uh, you know, they have the purse strings with this, so they were able to, to, to provide uh, two bills. One was uh, uh, Senate Bill 1 on mental health, be able to provide where mental health is in, uh, not available in certain particular areas um, and in the state. And then also uh, looking at how do we train providers, how do we, what kind of providers do we need to be able to train them, uh, to be able to assist uh, individuals that are going through either addiction and or through depression uh, or trauma. Um, And uh, the other bill was a House bill, I think it was 1006, that was uh, about being able to assist with the mental health needs of those that have been incarcerated and then have been released. So that is one example of how if uh, the people in the pews know what's going on uh, from a state point of view or even from a federal point of view, let's just take the farm bill, for for Mm -hmm. example, is a good example of that that has more than just the idea of food involved and it has a lot of different aspects to it that um, if they are informed and being able to learn what those are and why, we as a a Catholic Church um, supports and wants particular elements to be part of those particular bills. 
uh, to help the common good. There's okay. always rooms for, room for advocacy. Yes. Mm -hmm. And for people who listen or sign up for mm -hmm. ICANN reports, we mm -hmm. can give them a lot of information mm -hmm. about how they can be either very active and vocal advocates. Um, yes. When I say vocal, you know, when there is a bill, uh, when session mm -hmm. is, is in, actually testifying if it's something that, you know, they feel so moved to, or, you know, having conversations with family and, and, and exactly. friends, educating them. Mm -hmm. um, to be an advocate, you don't have to, you know, st stand on the street corner with a banner. No. There are a lot of different ways to be an advocate to promote, to promote the common good. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. That's true. Well, thank you for coming and talking with us about you're, what you're you welcome. do. We appreciate all your good work yeah. and continued blessings in oh. promoting the common good. Well, thank you for your work. And uh, as always, you know, in the church, we do things together and we all might have a different perspective on things, but the perspective is always on the good of the person, the good of her family, and the good of the neighborhood. So thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.